शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतिर द्यावशांतिर दिशा शांतिरावांतर दिशा शांतिरक्निशांतिर वायु शांतिरादित्य शांतिस चंद्रमा शांतिर नक्षत्राणि शांतिराप शांतिरोषदयशांतिर वनस्पतयशांतिर गाओशांतिरजाशांतिरश्वशांति पुरुषशांतिर ब्रह्मशांतिर ब्राह्मणशांति शांतिरेवशांति शांतिर में अस्तु शांति ही मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काई मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शंस मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरीवन एंड इन एवरीथिंग सर्वेत्र सुखिन सन्त सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्रा पश्य कचि दुख भाग भवस्तर तो दुर्गा सर्वो भद्रा पश्य सर्वसद्बुद्धिमात नंदतो मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मे ऑल सी वॉट इज गुड एंड मे नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरी मे ऑल ओवरकम देर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मे पीपल एवरीवेयर फाइन जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in everyone the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
शांति 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 ही हरि ही हो सत्कमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आविरावीर्मेधि रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम ते नित्यम मे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us we begin today on verse number 41 in the earlier verse in verse number 40 krishna points out that there is no being anywhere in this universe who is free from these three gunas these three gunas sattva rajas tamas manifest in the lives of all of us and they are the ones that bind us they are the ones that keep us tied to this constantly changing perishable world of matter see these gunas are the ones that bind us and no one is free from them then the question is is there any hope to be ever free from them because the goal according to the gita is to be free from all limitations moksha but we are being tied down by these three gunas so how can we become free that's why krishna now begins discussion in the subsequent part of this chapter about if we carry out the duties and responsibilities that we have at different stages in life in a proper way then we can become free from these gunas which have tied us down So verse number forty-one. Brahmana Kshatriya Visham, Shudra Nam Chaparan Tapa, Karmani Pravibhaktani, Swabhava Prabhavair Gunaihi. the duties of the brahmanas kshatriyas and vaishyas as also of the shudras are clearly divided or scorcher of foes according to the dispositions born of their own nature so here is mentioning four different categories people now this verse is is needs a little bit of discussion because the caste system as it is understood and as it is been described and defended and condemned it's so it's become a pretty controversial topic and this um, section of the gita as also in the earlier chapters in chapter 4 when krishna says that i created these four varnas so there are the two terms varna and jati and the whole the concept of varna and jati the two different terms in sanskrit gets kind of amalgamated into this english translation of the whole system called uh, caste so i would like to say something about the caste system itself to put this into context first of all uh, first thing to remember is that the caste system is not a part of the spirituality that the gita is teaching caste system is a is a social system is a part of indian society it's not strictly a part of the hindu religion and that's the first problem that is created every time 
There is a discussion about Hinduism, especially the classroom, textbook variety of Hinduism. Um, caste system becomes like as if that's the most important thing in Hinduism. But it's actually a part of the Indian society. So caste system was never meant to be universal, partly because in the times in which this system evolved in the Indian subcontinent, no one even crossed the seas. Many of them were not even familiar with, with India as, it we, as we know it today. So it was, everything was pretty um, insular in many ways. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember, and which is, should be obvious to us now, that no matter which part of the world we go to today, there's always a division of labor. Um, and it's also necessary for every community. Uh, we, need, we need people who are intellectuals, who think, who are familiar with the ancient wisdom, who are familiar with history. Uh, we need um, people who are strong, who can defend the community against dangers. Uh, we need people who can uh, provide the necessities of the community through trade. And then, of course, we need people who can serve the community. So the need of these different service sectors, if you like, uh, is necessary in any community, as much necessary as it was thousands of years ago as it is there in the 21st century. Now we have to see how did this division of labor evolve into a social system, per se. For that, we'll have to, for the time being, keep aside our present 21st century sensibilities, or even 20th century. Because many of us really uh, are products of 20th century. We just entered the 21st, except the millennials. So those of you who are very young uh, here. The pace with which the world has changed, especially in recent decades, is, is, is phenomenal. So even, I would guess, as far back as not too long ago, maybe just 150 or 200 years ago, so it's really not that far, considering how old uh, our human history goes, pretty much most people in most parts of the world, wherever they were born, that's where they grew up, that's where they, they had their childhood, their youth, that's where they married, that's where they did some work, that's where they started a family, that's where their children grew up, that's where they grew old, and that's where they eventually died. Most people in most parts of the world, even except maybe sailors, traders, and some adventurers. There's always a minority of people doing that. But the majority of the people pretty much remain confined to wherever they were born. Go back further when there were even no railroads. Forget about cars and aeroplanes. Where today jet travel has made it so easy, we can go within hours to even the other side of the globe. But go back even Go back even before the wheel was invented, if you like. See, when there were no bullock carts, there was nothing. So well, how far can you walk? So pretty much everything, the, the communities were very insular. Now, think about a community going back several centuries ago, where pretty much everyone had to be self-sufficient. Yes, there were kings, maybe. There were some rulers. But they, even then, maybe they traveled on horsebacks. Uh, but even then, the common people were, had to be self-sufficient. Today, if there's a shortage of um, um, doctors or engineers, you can outsource the job. You can get people to come. It was impossible in centuries ago. So now think about a typical town or a village. Now that town or a village well, needed a priest take care of the, the religious and spiritual needs of the people. 
to do all the sacraments, the worship, the rituals. You needed someone who is learned, who is qualified to take care of that. A village, also a town, needed um, some strong men and women who could protect in times of danger. Uh, the town also needed uh, people who could produce stuff. Agriculture was such an important part in ancient societies and it's today as well. So you needed people to growers and to make food available to all. And then of course you needed people to take care, to serve everyone. Now, and if, when, I, when I say service sectors, think about plumbers, blacksmiths, uh, all carpenters, all of these, every village needed to do these things. Now, eventually, we all grow old. What if in a village or a, temp or, or a town, the priest has gotten old, or the, 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 the soldier has gotten old, or the trader has gotten old? What will the next generation do? There was no school to go to, to learn the, uh, the carpentry. There was no school to go to, to learn medicine. There was no school to go to, to learn any of these things. And therefore, in the absence of any schools where these trades could be taught, the most natural way was, well, just do what your dad did. Because you're at home, right from your childhood, you are seeing your dad doing things. And so everything was as an apprenticeship. You were an apprentice to whatever you saw the elders in your family were doing. That is how these things got, became hereditary. And so a priest's son became a priest, a soldier's son became a soldier, a, a, a farmer or a trader's son became a trader or a farmer, and so on. That's how it became. Now, the hereditary nature was inevitable in those ancient times, times, but also necessary. What if, think about it this way, what if a farmer's son in a small village said, I'm not interested in farming, doesn't interest me, I want to do art, or I'm interested in music. Then the village was, oh no, then who is going to do farming in the next, in the next generation? There wasn't like there was a lot of large pool of uh, people warming the benches to say, OK, you go there. There wasn't anything. To you. Then the, the community said, sorry, you have no choice. Your dad was doing this. You got to do this. You are interested in art. Do it in your free time. I don't know whether the concept of weekend was there then. <laughs> but whatever you like to do, do it, that would be an extra something. But we want that you, this is what you have to do. That is how these different vocations in life became hereditary. It was inevitable, but also necessary in those olden days. But this is not really a problem from a spiritual standpoint. What Krishna will point out again and again is that what work you do, whether you are a priest or you are a soldier or you are a farmer or you are a trader or whatever work you do, that's not a hindrance to your becoming free from the hold of the three gunas. If you do your work properly in the spirit of yoga, you will be as free as anybody in this spectrum. So all of these different duties in our community had, they mark the word duty, they were duties. The emphasis has shifted in the times in which we live. Maybe the Reformation and, and the modern period, if you like. Um, the emphasis nowadays is on rights. Every, pretty much most constitutions in the world today um, speak about fundamental rights or basic rights. We have bill of rights. We don't have bill of duties. We don't speak of fundamental duties. But how can there be any right without a corresponding duty? It's like this. If I have a right to, right to do what I want, but 
the person sitting opposite to me has also the same right to do what he or she wants. Now, if what I do prevents that person from doing what he or she wants, then I'm infringing on the right of that person. And therefore, my first duty is not to infringe on the rights of someone else. So duties, the concept of duty, is inseparable from, sorry, the concept of rights is inseparable from the concept of duty. So one of the problems of the times in which we live is everyone is so conscious about their rights. Everyone is fighting for their rights. But we don't always see that same insistence on recognizing our duties. So that's the basic problem with this system. The, the questions that we today ask is, why should a person born in a certain caste have to do only that and nothing else? Now, this being a social system, the system cannot remain constant because society has changed. The society today is no longer same as it was many years ago. It's no longer same as it was even 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So social laws, social systems have to evolve as society changes. And that is why if we try to apply any of these social rules as they were applied centuries ago, then of course we have a right to be incensed about it. We have a right to, to say this is crazy. And so if at all we have to criticize the caste system, it's the institutionalization of that system even when the society has changed. Or you could say it's the, it's a little bit like this. If you are using an app, nowadays everybody talks in terms of, think about it this way, more than maybe even 10 years ago, I would think, maybe 15 years ago, probably a little more than 10 years ago, if you had used the word app, nobody would have understood what you're talking about. So now everyone knows apps. Now, if you start using any app you like very much, it's doing great work on your smartphone or your tablet. Now, what if the developer of that app stops updating it? So you have a, a new uh, uh, upgrade your operating system, but this app no longer functions well. It has lots of bugs because it has not been, uh, not been uh, updated then that app is going to be problematic. And of course, you have a right to then to protest. You have a right to criticize that app developer saying, this needs updating. Think about the caste system as an app, which was made for that operating system. And if it is not updated, then we have a right to be upset about it. And that's why Swami Vivekananda said, there is, you see, in, in the Indian tradition, uh, in Vedanta, there are two classes of scriptures, two classes of texts. Um, one is called the Shruti, and those are primarily the Vedas and the Upanishads. The others are called Smriti. Now, Smriti include epics, includes history. Uh, it also includes all of these social laws. They're sometimes called collectively as um, Dharma Granthas or or books dealing with dharma, of how these principles have to be applied in social life. Now, if society changes, these rules need to be modified. And that's why in the Indian social system, several smritis have come. Now, among them, some of them were very famous. And the one that gets quoted very often and also reviled and criticized very often was called Manu Smriti. There was this great sage called Manu who had formulated a certain rules for the time in which he lived. That was centuries, centuries ago. Now, invoking that book today would be foolish, which is not to say that everything in that book is nonsense. There's clearly certain things are applicable even today, but a lot of things really need updating. And that's why Swami Vivekananda said that we need, we need a new smriti 
a new set of social laws written today in every generation which needs updating. Now, in some sense we can say, although that's not exactly what Swami Vivekananda meant, in some sense we can say that, I don't know the statistics like how many countries in the world today are, are democratic and have a, a constitution uh, and monarchies, I really don't have the figures for that. But at least we can say that those countries which have a, a constitution, in kind of a broad way we can say that the basic social expectations and rules are embedded in the constitution of a country. And because, again, I'm not making a very flat general statement, but by and large, at least in countries which self-identify as secular countries, um, the constitution is based on secular values. But that's the best that we can come to. No constitution can be said to have been very perfect. Um, and even if it is perfect, we already know that even the same text is, gets interpreted by different people in different ways. But that's probably the closest we can come to today for a document which is put together by a group of people, a committee, a done work done by a committee, again, you know, it has its own problems, uh, who have done their best with the best of intention that these are the set of rules, these are the set of laws we will live by. And of course, as we know, in different time then there are amendments, things need to be changed, improved and so on. And there's a lot of debate about it. The kind of Smriti Swami Vivekananda was thinking about was a little different and I'm not sure whether such a thing would ever be possible in the kind of social climate in which we are growing in different parts of the world, whether there'll be some extraordinary being who is widely revered can come and say, this is the rules we will follow. It's clear, one thing is clear, that we cannot, just as we cannot have, it just wouldn't work to have one constitution for the whole world, although people do sometimes speak about a global government, uh, just seems more like an idea than, than uh, something that will actually happen. Uh, so even just as one constitution may be fit for a certain society, certain country, while it can inspire the drafters of constitution in some other parts of the world, but to kind of just take it and just apply it blindly wouldn't work. Because again, while there are a lot of things that we share in common in different parts of the world, in a lot of ways, things are also different. So we will have to apply these principles to the specific communities, specific countries, specific societies, and so on. The criticism against caste system comes because of the kind of um, the sensibilities we have today. It's like, oh, why should I be forced to do a certain kind of work when I don't really like it? If I don't like it, I won't be happy. So this is what makes me happy. This is what I'm going to do. Now, of course, we must all do what makes us happy. But if my quest for happiness is going to result in unhappiness to a larger group of people, I have to ask myself, would I be able to even enjoy my happiness if as a result of my effort to make myself happy is going to put others into trouble? And in that ancient society, as I said, if a doctor's son said, I just want to do art, then the next generation wouldn't have anybody with medical knowledge. And so other people would suffer. Well, this person can go and do art as much as he or she wants. Maybe this person will also fall ill one day and may have a problem. So that would be a very selfish thing to do, that I want to be happy. I don't care what happens to others. Now, if I'm selfish, it is this kind of selfishness that is that leads to 
sooner or later, usually sooner than later, uh, individual and collective uh, sorrow, dukkha. So you can see how all these things are connected and interconnected. One other point I will say before I uh, stop this discussion on caste is a lot of this caste system has survives today primarily in textbooks, in classrooms, those who are studying Hinduism through, through books. But it also survives in some form in, in um, Indian society even today, not in the way as it was intended. It survives today, um, first of all, as, as, as um, what, what we today might call a special interest groups. So just like um, there are special interest constituencies and in democratic societies, when leaders have to be elected um, periodically, they need the support of people. And they need the support of groups who are, who are loyal to them. And so if they can do something to, to make that group happy, uh, um, the, fulfill the interest that that group has, then you are assured of, of, of winning the next election. And so, sometimes even those groups which may not be so good for society um, survive because the leaders want them to survive. Because then that become uh, the kind of term that get used in the Indian subcontinent, they call it the vote bank, as if you're assured of those votes if you do what those people want. So that's one of the reasons the caste system survives mostly in political contexts. The other context in which it survives, and it's probably that context is dying out slowly, in some of the orthodoxies, some of the orthodox families, especially in terms of um, um, marriage primarily, but also other sacraments, uh, where, um, again, the days of having arranged marriages is slowly going away. But again, there is the thing about we'll do it the way our caste does it. So in some of these aspects, the caste survives today. But in major aspect, even in the Indian subcontinent, the caste doesn't survive. The caste is there in the minds of people, but not in practice. For instance, if someone were to follow the caste laws as it was there in ancient times, you would not be able to go in any public transportation. You can't go to any restaurant. When you go to a, go take a public transport, you have no idea who's sitting next to you. When you go to a restaurant, you have no idea who has cooked your food, who brings your food to your table. All the caste laws get completely uh, demolished. So again, as I said, it's a very selective application of caste that exists in certain contexts in India today. Having said that, in the textbook variety of Hinduism, caste is still considered like an almost inseparable part of the Hindu tradition. So that's one of the, the problems. So I, I needed to give this big introduction because this is a lot of this, this, this verse and the following verse will then speak about the qualities necessary for these four basic groups. The priest, the, and just to kind of give them the priest, I don't mean just the priest, but you understand what I'm saying. The, the one who is um, a learned, one who is a thinker, one who helps carry out some of the intellectual, scholarly, ritual work in any community, that would be the priest. The one who is um, strong, helpful, defender, and the qualities will be described in subsequent verses. That's the, that's the kshatriya. Uh, the farmer, the agriculturer, the trader is the Vaishya. And then the Shudra is one who serves. Now, all of these four um, are certain, um, are associated with certain qualities. And the qualities will be described, as I said, in subsequent verses. Now, one other point needs to be kept in mind, that these four categories as hereditary units, 
and these four categories as standing for um, ideals, if you like, or or the. Uh, let me explain. I think uh, instead of trying to give a, a word to it, um, for instance, someone say born a, a, a soldier's son uh, may not necessarily have soldierly qualities or, or a farmer's son may have no quality necessary to be a good farmer or a good trader. And yet, according to this social system, that person will be saying, whether you have quality or not, this is what you've got to do. So this caste system as a vocation, as a certain special specialty in certain trades, um, being expertise in certain trade, that is unchangeable. That was unchangeable in ancient times. That is, if you are born in a certain family, that's what you had to do, because there was no option. But that. By that was not implied in any case that you were automatically qualified for it. Qualification was not implied. Even that, that you had the necessary qualities for it were not implied either. So that was understood. So they were fully aware that this is not a perfect system. But that was the system that, that worked. And as I said, um, we don't have to apply the same system now because the society has changed. Now, in this system, as far as the qualities were concerned, the idea was this. It was possible to be the son of a farmer. A farmer's son expected to do the farmer's work, but yet have the qualities that an ideal Brahmin would have. It was possible to be born in a Brahmin family, not have any qualities for a Brahmin, maybe have the qualities which are better suited for a Shudra or a Vaishya. So the quality and your expertise and what work you had to do, they were not necessarily always in harmony. That was also completely understood. So when it was said that the priest or the Brahmin um, commanded the greatest respect in the Indian society, by that was meant not the one born in a Brahmin family, not just by birth, but if you had the Brahmin qualities, irrespective of which particular group you were born in, those were the people who commanded respect. And that's why some of the great leaders and even great um, teachers, great saints, have come from all the four categories. So it wasn't as if only Brahmins were all spiritual people, and all of the others were less spiritual. Far from it. So that's an important point to remember, that one's spirituality, spiritual quality, was not connected with which family you were born in and what work you did. So that is another one important point to remember. With that in mind, let's read this verse again. <clears throat> The duties of the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, as also of the Shudras, are clearly divided, or scorcher of foes, according to the dispositions born of their own nature. Now, before we go to the subsequent verses, I want to, I want to make uh, two further remarks. Uh, one is this, that <clears throat> today, when even in societies, where caste system was never, a, never was there, even in ancient times. Um, we know, even in the American society, for instance, there is division of labor. And although all of us have freedom to do what we want, oftentimes we don't get to do what we want. That's just the reality. We have the freedom, uh, but, but I may not, I either may not have the opportunity I may not have the talent for it. It's like, oh, I love, I, I love music. I want to be a musician. Or maybe I don't have any talent for music, music. Or maybe I have talent for it. Unfortunately, there is no opportunity for it. Or maybe there is an opportunity. I don't have the finances for it. So 
just because we have freedom to do something today doesn't automatically mean that we are really able to do what we want. So that's another thing. So it wasn't as if only in ancient times, only in this caste system, people had to do what they didn't like and today we can do what we want. No, even today, all of us can't do what we want. So that's, that's, that's still a similarity. The second thing is, uh, and this I heard from the, the Pandit, the teacher under whom I studied in, in Chennai. Uh, he was a great Vedic scholar. Uh, he was a Brahmin, of course. <clears throat> and um, so he used to say, he said um, in that discussion on caste in modern times, uh, that the Brahmin is glorified so much and everybody like, well, I want to be the highest caste. But he said, if people only know what was expected of a Brahmin, nobody would want to be a Brahmin. Um, he said, first of all, a Brahmin was not supposed to accept any kind of remuneration, no salary of any kind. The, the Brahmin's life was supposed to be extremely austere, no luxury. They, had, they couldn't use a, a thick mattress to sleep. They had to sleep on a hard floor. So, again, the emphasis has changed from duties to, to privileges. So only when people started demanding privileges, that's where the corruption began. That just because I know these texts, spiritual texts, and I can say some mantras and you can go to hell, so you better give me what I want, and then I'm really exploiting. I'm exploiting the sacred duty I have to serve the community to, for my own selfish purpose. That's where the privileges come in. Again, if I'm a soldier, or I'm carrying weapons, I'm carrying weapons to protect this community, but I can use the same weapons to threaten the community and do extortion. Well, that's privilege. Similarly, if I'm a trader, I know these people depend on me for their food. Maybe I'll stock my food and not make it available to them. Maybe I will hike the prices, make them pay more. Again, I'm exploiting others. So this kind of exploitation tendencies in order born through selfishness and the quest for power, the quest to control, these are the kind of things that have brought in corruption. It was not the system itself, the system was great. Great for the times in it was there. And that's why sometimes people get confused. When they read Swami Vivekananda's books, you find in many places, Swamiji is extremely critical about the caste system. He, in, in, in very strong terms, he just criticizes it. But there are some other places, he's, he really speaks highly about him. It's like, wait a minute. How come you can condemn here and you can say wonderful things here? Now, in order to understand these apparently mutually conflicting statements, we need to look at the whole picture. And then we can see the system at that time applied in a proper way was perfect for a society, as perfect as any social system can be. Other than God, no one is perfect. So no social system is perfect. It wasn't perfect even then but it was what worked best. As society changed, we have to change it. If you don't change it, if you don't update your app, there will be bugs in it. Secondly, whatever work you did, it had no relation to your spiritual progress. Anyone in any stage of life, with no matter what duty they had, could become spiritually free. And one other statement, and I stop. <laughs> Uh, the, the pundit told me that the moment we st start accepting uh, remuneration, we are already shudras. So he says that was one of the things in the, in the old uh, the Dharma Shastras, that um, a shudra is one who is paid for the work that is done. So all, everyone, pretty much most people who hold jobs, um, they, according to the system, they are really shudras. And they might have their own privilege. I'm a Brahmin, I'm this, etc. That doesn't work. So as I said, even those people who swear by caste system apply it very selectively. Okay. Now, if you have any thoughts, ideas, comments, questions. This is a pretty long introduction, but I think it was necessary to, to put the, the whole system. Because there is a lot of 
misunderstanding about it. And there is a lot of, uh, either people get very defensive about it, or people are extremely critical about it. We don't need to do either. We just need to understand what it is. Yeah. So, Swamiji, I had a question on duties, per se. When you think of some of the duties that are coming in the following verses, they include things like be serene, be austere, mm -hmm. which I would interpret as, if not duties, beaties. Yeah, well, so I mean, it, the word, it's Sanskrit, they put it as duties. Uh, the, it is, it, what it really means is that is what Brahmins are expected to do. That's what Brahmin, that's who a Brahmin is. So to the extent my life reflects those qualities, which will come into subsequent verses, uh, I'm a Brahmin by quality. And as I said, uh, Brahmin by birth or this, this thing will may make some sense today to people born in, uh, in India, uh, Hindus born in India, uh, but it pretty much is meaningless to people in other parts of the world. And uh, yeah, so we have to find out a different social system for that. Huh? Yeah. <coughs> Swamiji, is, you explained the natural uh, reason or the evolution of the caste system but in India in, in those times. But when we compare with other regions, they also had their own forms of caste system. Oh, sure. Yes. But I guess why would there was a major difference in even the nature of evolution compared from one region to another region of the world? I well, I mean, the thing is this. Um, the, the division of society into different groups occurs. Sometimes it can occur in, um, with, with, I mean, what are the groups that is common to all parts of the world today is what we generally say, rich or poor. The haves and the have-nots. Uh, maybe if you go to, um, especially in UK and those parts, there are the lords, there are the, the class. So it's not so much a caste, it's class. Even the race for that matter. I mean, the race is the big issue here in the United States. So society gets divided whether it's in based on, on the work that people do, the color of their skin, or again, nobility, as it is in UK. That's just the way human beings are. And uh, the way the system got institutionalized in India, it became hereditary. And then they applied the word caste to it. I mean, caste is an English word. Uh, none of the Hindu texts are written in English. So obviously, some word which existed and meant something in English has been applied to the system in India. Because the English is not a native language in India. Yeah. Yeah. Namaskar, Swamiji. I have three questions. Um, the first is just from the perspective of being a spiritual seeker. I, I, my sense is that um, the main uh, driving point is that as long as we keep the focus on ourselves and um, just look deeply within to inquire who we are and discover our divine nature that that's basically what our job is and not to um, look externally so my question is as a spiritual seeker why be concerned with social laws and social structures well, spiritual seeker is one who seeks the spirit. But a spiritual seeker is still, I mean, if a spiritual seeker just goes into a forest and stays in a cave eating fruits and roots, then probably that person doesn't have to worry about social laws. That's what the sannyasin in the ancient times was. The sannyasin was no more a part of society. So because the sannyasin went to the forest and lived there out of the community, therefore the community said, you are freed from all duties because you're no longer a part of us. But if a spiritual seeker is living in society, <coughs> then, uh, then you have duty. Then you cannot simply ignore society because your presence in society, you are being benefited in direct and indirect ways by the community. And therefore, you have certain obligations toward the community. So you cannot totally then ignore it. So to use your metaphor of the app, as spiritual seekers living in society, it is our obligation to help society update the app. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, we are living in society, we are deriving benefit from the society. So if I'm getting something, I need to contribute something toward it. 
including driving change? Well, that's what, I mean, that's what in, in, in a democratic setup, therefore, you know, if every, say, there are 300 million people, all of them can't drive change. So what they do, and that's how the democratic system has evolved, that amongst us then, we will elect a smaller number of people. They say, okay, you sit together, and then you drive it. And so long as you drive it the way we want you to, we will keep you there. Otherwise, we'll put some other people there. And that's what our elected officials do. Okay. Uh, thank you. The second question I had was about the Smriti. So you mentioned that the, the laws need to be adapted to the realities of the society. So in Vedanta, we start with, or we end with, I guess it's both us, the starting point and the conclusion that everything and everyone is equal. Because it's spiritually. all good. spiritually. Spiritually. Okay. I guess if equality is such a fundamental principle, then can we use that as a way to say that that is an absolute principle, absolute law that never changes regardless of? I think, I mean, I mean, it, it kind of sounds great. We are all equal. Um, But the reality, we are not equal. Now, I'm, not, I'm saying it in a very positive way. And that is, first of all, according to age, a five-year-old and a 25-year-old obviously are not equal. I can lift much heavier weight than a little child can. So clearly, with age, um, our physical capacity, we are not equal according to our physical capacity. We see also that we are not equal according to our mental capacity also. Again, a little child can understand a few things, but a grown-up, hopefully, not all grown-ups do. <laughs> but, but, but mostly, we become more mature. Um, so again, people who are accustomed to living in, in extreme cold weather and people who are living in, say, tropical countries, again, they are not equal as far as their capacity to bear this extreme temperature is concerned. So in, again, uh, what a musician can do, suppose someone has a talent for music, what that person can do, I cannot simply pick up a violin and start playing in the same way. So in terms of our, our talents, our capacities, our physical, mental abilities, we're not really equal. Now, when we speak about equality, we don't really mean this kind of equality. What we normally mean is that we provide equal opportunity that everyone has an equal opportunity, e everyone has an equal chance to express themselves, although they may express themselves differently. Uh, everyone has, um, yeah. So that's, in that sense, as understandable in society, uh, there must be equal opportunity for all. But to kind of think that we are all equal in every way, I think that word equal needs to be qualified a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Hello, I think. So um, I guess what I was struggling with is kind of like, how does one justify vast wealth, wealth and income inequality? Uh, you know, because that's a structural issue. And so from a Vedantic perspective, what is the, what is our role as seekers in addressing that inequality, but maybe that's yeah. another discussion for another yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can, I can still very briefly address that, and it is this. I think income inequality itself would not be a problem if everyone involved had also saw it as their duty to provide for one who is in need. I mean, think about it this way. Um, if my needs are fulfilled, whatever I want is fulfilled, it really doesn't make too much difference if I have one million dollars in my bank balance or if I have hundred million dollars. I mean, how much, I mean, how much I still have 20, only 24 hours in a day. Even the wealthiest person has only 24 hours in a day. Um, I mean, how much more comfortable a bed can you have? I mean, there is a limit to how much comfortable. I mean, how much can I eat? So. So um, while it's kind of good to kind of rail against you know, this income inequality and there is justification for doing so, um, I, I think that income inequality is a problem only because those who have 
are not willing to share with those who don't have. If everyone, that's where the concept of duty comes in, a duty to help someone in need. If that was followed by all, it doesn't matter if some people are rich, some people are poor, what does it matter? That's the idea. Can I ask one last question? Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, there was a really wonderful New York Times article that came out a few days ago about how a socio sociological uh, a solution to the crisis that we are in, in terms of uh, poverty and the gap. And one of the main points is this idea of uh, the, the stigma of being poor and the loss of identity and purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, from a spiritual perspective, uh, what might be a solution to the destigmatization de of marginalized groups, including poor people, racial minorities, LGBTQ people, women, mm -hmm. transgender well, Yeah, I mean, it's kind of gone both ways. I mean, there, there is this uh, liberation theology which glorifies the poor. It's like, you know, the poor, that God loves, somehow God loves the poor more than God loves the rich. And the rich kind of get, um, in fact, in that way of thinking, rich are the ones, a lot of people feel like, oh, if you're rich, you're automatically materialistic, automatically bad. And if you're poor, somehow you're more saintly. And that's a very wrong connection. Um, but the other way is this, that um, theology, theologically, I think it was um, Calvin, Calvinistic um, theology, which, uh, among others, was the first one to equate God's love with prosperity. So the idea was that, how do I know that God loves me? That God, lo and the, the, the connection made was, well, if God loves me, then I will have whatever I want. I'll be more prosperous. I'll be more rich. Now, there is no really proof for it. This was just kind of a connection made, and which actually helped in some way um, society, because a lot of people then started working hard. It's like, because if I become wealthy, then that's a sign that God loves me. And in those societies where God's suffering was, um, you know, Jesus suffered for us on the, on the cross. So when the suffering became more central theologically, uh, those countries did not become as prosperous uh, as the Calvinistic mm, societies. Because that was like, well, if I'm suffering, I'm suffering. I'm, I'm partaking in the kind of suffering that Jesus had. So, mm. so suffering was glorified in one place. Prosperity was glorified in other. So religion is partly responsible, at least in the Western world, uh, for, for this kind of a, this thing. But that's a big subject, so some other time. Yeah, uh, yeah Mahindra? Yeah. Manu Samhita. And the way I was thinking about was that the, it is the laws which are still right now currently in the present day society, the English law, the American law, is still coming from that sort of, uh, of Manu Samhita. Is that, is that true, though? In a way, you said that not everything is applicable now in the Well, oh, there are some, some things are wonderful in that. But there are a lot of things are just, which sounds terrible today, uh, because, you know, it's like uh, if, what, if our document today, something that makes sense to us, you take it a thousand years ago and show it to some person there, that person would be equally horrified. But times change, I think, yeah. yeah. OK, so um, uh, I'll encourage you to give some thought to this uh, question, not only about caste system as it evolved and developed and, and uh, got corrupted in the Indian society, but also about how these social groupings occur in different parts of the world, and the kind of problems these kind of insular groups in different societies create, um, and their implications, and so on. Um, and then, then we will come back uh, next Wednesday and then continue this discussion. In the next three verses then, um, Krishna will describe the qualities associated with these four uh, primary uh, types in any society. 
ओम जननी सारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पादपद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मु on sunday our subject will be a purity patience and perseverance in swami vivekananda's letter he often quoted this he called it three p's so we'll uh, reflect a little bit on on the meaning of these three our uh, next wednesday we'll continue with this study and on tuesday and saturday our aarti and meditation will also continue as usual let's con- uh, conclude with the prayer now on page 3 May the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians holy one of the Jewish faith Allah of the Muslims Buddha of the Buddhists Tao of the Taoists Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians the great spirit of the native Americans and Brahman of the Hindus lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may we be granted strength freedom and clear understanding may we learn to see god in our own hearts and in everyone around us may god bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude grace and love om shanti 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 hi peace 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 be unto